All right, welcome everybody to the ITI VR Technical Advisory Group monthly discussion. Um, I'm Mandy Henry and I am the Communities and Marketing Manager here at ITI. And our Technical Advisory Group um, is a group of companies that are early supervisors and operators of um, our VR equipment, and so companies such as IUOE, Shell, Nucor, GE, um, they are part of our technical advisory group, and if you want any more information how you can become a part of the group, you can visit our website at um, iti.com slash VR. And today we're going to be talking about our overhead crane um, VR simulator. And our presenter today is Ken Laird, and he is our product coordinator of VR and online. And we have two special guests today. We have Mike Parnell, and he is the ITI technical director. And we have Heath Hooker. He is the Nucor Steel Yamato uh, technical maintenance supervisor. And a little bit more about ITI. We have we visit client locations all around the world, and we do training courses, and we also have nine training centers in North America, and we specialize in um, rigging and lifting operations and crane operations, and we also have ITI online, and so that is our e-learning center where you can do a course anytime that you want at home in your pajamas or just on your own time um, to learn any rigging or crane operator courses. And we also have virtual reality training simulators. And I'll get a little bit more into that in my next slide. And we also have the ITI bookstore where you can buy books on rigging and not tying. And we also have create the journeyman um, cards that the fold up cards that they keep in their pockets. And if you want any more information, you can visit us at www.iti.com. So a little bit more about our virtual reality simulators. We have simulators from the rough terrain crane to lattice boom crawler. That's misspelled, I'm sorry. And we also have um, overhead crane, tower crane, um, aerial work platform. Um, and for more information on that, you can visit our website um, at iti.com slash VR. And we also have LIGHT, which is Leadership in Industrial Technology, Education, and Safety. And that is just our side, our project off of ITI. And we put on events, kind of like an open house event, where we demo our virtual reality simulators. And we have a community that gets together and talks about anything from advanced building materials to 3D scanning to our virtual reality products. And we also have a podcast. Um, episode six was just released a couple weeks ago. And if you want to uh, listen and subscribe to our podcast, um, you can go to www.lights.org or you can also find us on iTunes. And so here is our, gen our agenda for today. Um, so we're going to spend about 20 minutes talking about the environment and white box scenarios. And then we're going to spend another 20 minutes talking about the crane operation discussion and any general feedback that Ken and Mike and Heath might have or any new scenarios that are in the overhead crane simulation, such as pancake flips, um, pickup sticks, and bowling. And then at the end, we're going to have about a 15-minute Q&A period. And so if you see on the right side of your screen, um, there's a little question box. And if you have any questions during any time of the presentation, you can go ahead and submit your questions. And then I will be gathering those throughout the whole presentation. And then we will ask your questions at the end during our Q&A session. And I am going to hand the presentation over to Mike and Keith and Ken. Alrighty. So welcome everybody to the uh, to the webinar. 
uh, like to take a little bit of time to introduce our SMEs here. Uh, Mike, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, overhead crane experience? Yes. Uh, hi, Mike Parnell. I'm just uh, uh, I'm technical director for ITI, and our organizations provided uh, training and uh, consulting activities on mobile cranes, overhead cranes, and rigging since 1986. We were an early uh, participant in the qualification process uh, initiated by NCCCO on operator certification for overheads, and we've maintained uh, testing locations in uh, the southeast and northwest, both for uh, overhead crane. Um, so it's the virtual reality portion of this, which we'll be discussing later, incorporates um, sort of a partnership element with a CCO, which is their abbreviation for overhead crane operator uh, certification. And where we have the live equipment to do it under cranes for uh, clients and or at training centers, uh, we we also will uh, have the uh, same layout and same task and testing uh, uh, practice sessions available on the VR unit. And uh, so we'll see that, and it it will surprise you how amazingly uh, 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 close the VR is to the actual cranes. We've already experienced this in uh, our mobile crane um, silo for uh, CCO type practice with ball and barrel exercises and uh, test weight and chain working through Z corridor and things. and. It is uh, an amazing challenge, uh, it, it really equal to going out on the live crane and uh, executing the same tasks. So uh, we think we're going to be on par without question, and I'm excited to see the final product as we get closer. So uh, uh, our our experience and touch with overhead cranes is a long, long uh, trail. We have a number of our uh, uh, trainers and consultants on our staff who have years and years, probably a combined 140 to 160 years experience on overhead crane operations, uh, just as trainers and um, um, uh, inspectors and, and consultants. And so we've we've tapped them from time to time to help give us information and assist uh, on some of the technical issues, along with uh, Heath Hooker, Bo Fleming, and some others. Uh, within Nucor and, and uh, folks with Gunderson uh, and and other locations that are a part of this uh, technical advisory group. So we've uh, no shortage of expertise that have contributed to refining uh, how this overhead crane virtual reality is uh, coming together. So I'll stop there in a minute. I'm not sure if Heath has been able to join us on the call. Heath, are you there? Yes, sir. We're here, uh, myself and Bo Fleming. Fantastic. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves, uh, tell everybody where you're at, uh, and uh, then your, your initial involvement in working with ITI on this VR project. Okay. My name is Heath Hooker. I work at Nucor Yamato Steel in Blyville, Arkansas. I was overhead crane operator for six years, uh, been in crane maintenance for the last 12 as lead uh, of the overhead crane team. And uh, we got with ITI with some rigging training and started uh, a new training program at our facility and was interested in crane simulators, virtual reality, and partnered with ITI on helping develop this. Uh, it's been an ongoing deal. Can't wait to see it. Uh, we have the mobile crane simulator already at our facility and as mike said earlier it mimics sitting in the real seat and i expect and have no doubt that the overhead crane will be the same way i'm gonna let bo fleming introduce himself yeah much like Heath, my, my name is bo fleming much like Heath, i'm at uh, nucor yamato steel blival arkansas i've been there for 23 years uh, i've been running cranes at the facility for those most of those 23 years, probably 20 years. Um, I've ran all types of all types of arc overhead cranes, different tonnage and everything. Uh, what when Heath we got into this, this is a perfect training tool or defining tool to use to not put our equipment in jeopardy uh, and then get the same real feel of 
depth perception, uh, hand-eye control. Uh, we hire people. We want to. They say they can run cranes. This simulator will let us dabble into that. I think without putting them actually in a seat, and we'll get a better idea. That's what I. That's what I'm looking for. Is is to cut the time down on the training to explore uh, accident investigation. What did you do wrong? Those types of things are going to be a big benefit. Time savers. Um, it's going to get us down the road faster. Our training is going to accelerate by far. Uh, less time training. So I, I'm excited. I have no doubt it's going to be great. And and like Keith, I'm just excited to see it finally get going. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're really excited to show off what we have here and hope we can get some valuable feedback from you guys. Um, just as a follow-up comment before we go to the next slide, uh, this mic, I just man i can't tell you how much uh uh this these types of um types of equipment and approach it it get, it permits and allows a lot of seat time it gives us a, a a concept of the operator's capability and building skill sets uh it can can the operator do the candidate is is he or she really cut out for operations because not everybody is but it, it gives you the uh, it gives additional seat time, di different tasks are available, and then all without risk to the cranes and without cutting into production. So it really is a, a lifesaver for a company to be able to gain all that uh, all the benefits and value of that without actually interrupting operations and or potentially damaging equipment or requiring uh, you know a mentor to sit there right side by side with you. At an additional cost to try to uh, build skills, so uh, all it's trackable, um, and can you might we might address some of those things downstream here that event that we will be building in um, some scoring or tracking method that uh, LMS can be uh, recognized and and uh, witness and record, right? Yep, absolutely. Go ahead. All righty. So let's move on to our first slide here, uh, the environment. We really wanted to show this off to you guys. Uh, SLI has been uh, really hard at work developing this. Uh, who is SLI, so everybody knows? Uh, SLI, uh, Sirius Labs, uh, is our uh, developer for the software. They do all the uh, all the artwork, all the coding, all the assets, the environments. Uh, they're responsible for putting together this, uh, this warehouse environment, or a shop environment. Uh, it's a combination. You can see kind of the two sides in the uh, lower left-hand corner there. Uh, that one is a little bit higher off the ground than the other, but they're both they're both essentially designed to look the same. One's just taller. Uh, they they contain the 75 ton and 300 ton uh, cab operated overhead cranes. Um, the 300 ton side is ideal for the for the steelworks part of it. I think the guy the, that you guys will be interested in the charge bucket, the the ladle pour, and the steel beam scenarios. So I wanted to get uh, your feedback. What do you think? Does this look about how you envisioned it? Is it uh, does it, does it seem appropriate for a shop environment? Any comments or suggestions? Yeah, let me uh, uh, turn to Heath and Bo first. Go ahead, you guys. The middle picture, is that just uh, disproportionate because of the photo, or is that bay really that narrow? Uh, it's it's a little, it's about as wide as the other one in the uh, lower right-hand corner. It just, it is taller off the ground, and that's taken from the top of the environment. So it. It looks narrower. It's the same width. Okay. What what width is that scaled to? Well, I think we were working on a, a 90 foot by 200 foot bay. I think that was what okay. that was our footprint. Yep. And so it just it may be. Uh, I think that first one, the middle one, is the taller uh, bay, and the right hand one is the lower bay mm -hmm. for shipping and other utility handling in the lower bay and the steel. Uh, Steel industry base in uh, that's is either the melt shop or or uh, some of the pouring and ladle handling and all that will be in that middle one with the cab mounted. Uh, uh. Kim four, I get it. Looks good. Yeah, okay. I, right. I, that's, that was my first thought. Is we have a lot of <clears throat> where the cabs oriented, whether it be right or left, it, it doesn't really matter. But they, you know, a lot of the picks, what you're looking at for depth perception or sight line from cab would be, you know, we're 115 foot out, 100 foot in the air. 
So that angle, you know, and I, you know, I just, I, I, I thought the same thing. Maybe it's just like we're looking down a hallway, but most of our bays range from 100 to 115, I would think, in the melt shop. So, so we're pretty close, you know. Yeah. Yep. Right. Um, and and this is unique. I, or, or, I'm sorry, it's it's universal to, you know, it's. Um, it's, you know, some people could have an 80 foot wide base, some 90, 100, 110, 120. So it really, we're, what it's really about is skills building for the crane operator, right? That's right. So. It depends a lot more on how the crane operates as far as drift and, and you know, and how you catch your swing. And a lot of that other stuff is uh, is going to be, if he's got the skill to operate the crane, he's going to have the skill to do the, whatever distance it may be. You bet. Uh, what about the, is, is we're only going to let, the lighting come in is that outdoor lighting coming in uh, adequate lighting or, or how yep. we're gonna we have okay. crane lights underneath the crane okay. uh, I believe we talked about limiting the uh, the range of time to be like I think from like 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. so the light would always be shining in through those skylights uh, okay. we don't currently support night driving but if we do uh, if we do end up putting cab lights on there we can extend that range of hours that the crane operates okay all right Alrighty, so I'll go ahead and move on to the next slide here. This is good. All right, uh, so this is our environment layout, and you guys might remember that top sketch there. That was our uh, that was our original overhead crane, uh, the the blueprint where we laid out all the uh, all the uh, all the loads and uh, obstacles in the environment. Uh, and the bottom picture there kind of shows off what it what it looked like in in the uh, white box uh, with all the loads kind of splayed out over the floor, and uh, it's very nearly identical to that paper sketch. Uh, it just doesn't contain uh, the unused lifts and loads that we that we kind of cut out of the development cycle for for time purposes. But everything that is in there is going to be is going to be used in lifts and and. Uh, so you can uh, you can see for the visitors that are with us on this webinar and they are listening to the recording, you know how life sometimes always starts on the back of a napkin, uh, sketching something out, and ultimately that's what this sort of uh, started out to be—just a large piece of butcher paper, and we just started uh, hand drawing in some ideas and and uh, you know somewhat to scale and how would we put this play area together? It's a big training room basically. Uh, it involves uh, products that are pulp and paper mill base, steel fabrication base for welding, like putting barge sections together, uh, steel mill base, um, also utility based. Uh, uh, there's a there's a mobile crane down there on the floor, and there's a the boom for the mobile crane is uh, within 20 feet of it laying down there, and we need to pick the boom up and install it on the superstructure of the mobile crane. So that's one that's one scenario item that uh, is there, you know, in addition to steel beam handling, um, truck truck loading, truck offloading, there's just a whole uh, cadre of options here that we wanted to put into the bay that would give, um, you know, create skill sets. And you might talk about uh, when the assets are viewed or visible or not visible at what 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 opportunities exactly. those give, Ken? So the idea is that, uh, like in the 75 ton in, or yeah, 75 ton environment, uh, it's a it's a warehouse environment. You're supposed to have all this, you know, kind of laid out over the floor. You're just moving products back and forth. But if you get into the the steel crane, obviously you don't want the uh, you don't want the Tadano sitting there in the middle of the the steel shop environment. So those loads can be uh, labeled as inactive, and then they just won't show up in the uh, in the sim, or you could turn everything off and put the uh, NCCCO corridor in there because obviously you'd want a clean environment. And so SLI does that. I mean, they're going to build these lift scenarios, yep. and when they go to a hot sh or the melt shop environment with a charge bucket and all that, they'll simply deactivate exactly. non non pertinent assets. We won't even see them there. Mm -hmm. And but in the scenario that they'll control all that as a delivered package to us as a user. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Uh, well, any questions, guys? What about attachments? Uh, are we still rigging attachments? Do we have the spreader bar with the magnets, or how, how are we? Uh, you bet. All yeah. Of yep. Uh, for the for the steel beams, we've still got the the magnet bar that's going to activate and pick those beams up. Uh, we've still got the spreader bar. I believe that's just going to be a static attachment, but. Uh, 
for the charge bucket or the pouring ladle, mm -hmm. ladle pouring. Yep. Yeah, we have uh, all those uh, rigging components. And when the the crane gets to that component or gets to the item, it's asset that is picking up. There will be a time when uh, other scenarios talk about uh, now the rigging will be connected. The the screen might dim for a half second and then relight up, and all of a sudden, magically, the rigging is connected. And there are some cases where the operator is going to have to take the spreader bar and double J hooks and uh, the aux hook, the auxiliary hook with a hook, and go into a bucket and actually make the connection using right. the crane as if it's in a real environment. So it's okay. not a snap to, snap to rigging. It will actually be driven and manipulated by the operator to make that full connection and then pick the load up uh, within, you know, in a controlled manner. So right. um, it's, so we have some that uh, the function or process or task doesn't have to do with the manipulation of the rigging by the operator, uh, and some it does. Great, that's great. So we we're. Uh, yeah, go ahead. What's that? I was just wondering, did we keep our truck in there where we where we decided we was going to load a truck or something like that with I beam? Yeah, we. Head? Yes, we have a. a a truck going in effect north and south, a trailer, and also a trailer east and west. And the product is laying as it is, like the steel beams are laying there on the floor in bundles. And um, But I think we'll cover that on a future slide, but the uh, we do have the ability on a 75-ton crane to have a rotating trolley. Awesome. So we can pick the bundle up in one orientation, hoist, bring out to a clear area, rotate the bundle 90 degrees, and then land it onto a trailer in the appropriate orientation. That was what I was shooting for. Yep. Well, we'll talk about that on the on the uh, the the, uh, the scenarios uh, section. Okay. Go ahead and uh, move on. To yeah, that. let's go ahead. Yep. All right. Uh, so here we talk about uh, the crane body, and this is Right now, this is hanging in our uh, Tadano environment. So this is kind of like a pre-alpha sketch. We've been able to test it back and forth. Uh, we've sent a little bit of feedback back and we're hoping to get a dev build sometime this week from SLI. Uh, but as it is now, it's a, it's a custom built model crane. There's no, not like our, it's a little bit unlike our other cranes in that there's no one manufacturer tied to this. It's it's uh, built to, to spec. So it's a- uh, It's a custom VR crane and it's, it's not typically patterned around, let's say, a Kona crane, Whiting, or Ederer, or uh, Ace, or anybody. It's just it's uh, our our specific design, so it's not patterned uh, around any proprietary other uh, other equipment. Notice the end trucks are up there on the rail system. Um, Ken brought this to my attention. I hadn't noticed this, but the SLI people, uh, Serious Labs, Inc. Um, they've got the ability to do lots of things in texturing, but notice the difference between the top crane view and the other one below it. It's got the, the typical dirt and grime that you're going to find in a paper mill, steel mill, uh, uh, all kinds of, you know, just shading and texturing to try to make it as realistic as possible, right? I thought that was a really nice ad. It's it's a small it's all, detail, but yeah, it's an important one. It really adds to that sense of realism. Like it's not just a, a blocky crane that sits in an environment. It's a it's a crane that's been here for you know twenty thirty years, uh, and it's it's adaptable based on uh, certain you know factors that change uh, between the seventy five ton and three hundred ton crane types, or you know another tonnage that we might select in the future. The, the overall capacity, the acceleration speeds of the crane, uh, the hook height off the ground, and a number of other things that that you know, make subtle differences in the, in the, in the crane operation. Yeah. Like any that. ideas or any uh, feedback there, Heath? Or yeah, it looks good. You know, yeah, we could nitpick it to death, but overall that's a great uh, concept. I'd say roll with it. Yep. Yeah. It nice. Good. All right. Okay. Okay. And we'll move on to, uh, we talk a little bit more about the, the differences here. Uh, they use the same overall layout on the body, but there are some changes you can see in that picture there. The 75 ton is a little bit narrower between the two. It doesn't have that, that width on the on the truck. Uh, it's uh, It's got different numbering on the side to, to help you differentiate between the 75 and the 300. Uh, and as far as feel goes, uh, the 70, or sorry, the 75 ton is a little bit lighter crane, so it does get pulled around by the load some. 
uh, the 300 ton, it's heavier, it pulls those loads harder, and it gets pulled less when as it swings. So, and of course, the 300 ton uh, is the only crane that can handle the the charge bucket, the ladle pour, because it's, it's it's built for that. So, it's also the crane that has reverse plugging because the 75 ton crane has the variable frequency drive. There's no there's no option to reverse plug on the 75 ton. It's it just you know decelerates and then starts moving the other direction. The 300 ton will have reverse plugging, and that's that's an important feature for the charge bucket scenario because you have to use that to slow it down. And we've got that as a training element, you know, for skills skills building for the operators to getting all that timing down and the amount of you know rheostat, you might say, uh, movement with the uh, control mechanisms to to get used to making the crane predictable and doing it what you doing with it what you want and not being surprised by it right so that's we're really trying to build skills and get a feel for uh, uh, proper operation okay can I can I inject something here sure yeah uh, being that the uh, principle of reverse plug is developed being that the principle of the drive using XL D cells developed is there any way if if the 300 ton crane will never be operated by the remote simulator the belly box the 75 uh, yeah, ton what yep yeah, we've agreed that 300 ton cannot be operated by belly box but 75 ton can okay now that leads me up to my next question in the software is there any way that Anytime either one of these cranes are being ran by the desktop version or the motion-based chair, which is simulating a cab, that it be static stepless regardless of what crane. And when it's ran by remote, it is automatically set up for XL D cell because that is the way every one of our cranes are. If it's cab operated, it is reverse plug. If it's remote, it's XL D cell. Uh, so yeah, what, I can, what I'm I can. asking is, if we go into the remote belly box simulator mm -hmm. and pick the 70, with 75 tons, the only one that's an option there, then it's XL D cell. But if it is a simulator being operated through the motion-based chair or the desktop version, that it be static step, uh, that it be reverse plug. I think we can do that. Yeah, I will. I will get back to our developers on that. Uh, we can certainly. I mean, we can just say uh, from from the cab operated 75 ton, we add reverse plugging. Uh, from the from the uh, ground operated 75 ton, we just have strict acceleration deceleration. Yeah, you hit I can, the I can on the head that. right there. I mean, I spent three minutes saying what you did in 10 seconds. You sure did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but no, that's that's very important feedback. We'll pass that back to our developers. And I think because we have we've said reverse plugging in the cab on the 300 ton, it probably shouldn't be too much trouble to get it in 75 ton as well. It'll just take a little tweaking uh, to get the feel of the crane right. But yeah, absolutely. Good comment. He's writing it all down. I see him writing as we're talking here, so he's going to make sure okay. to yeah, check. Because that's, that'd be very important, especially when our shipping guys, our uh, row mill guys, you know, because they're cab operated and all of a sudden they go to Excel. You're throwing an operator that's used to reverse plug. I mean, it, he's he's going to get up and say, this doesn't help me. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we will pass that back to SLI. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. All right. I will move on to our first new scenario type, uh, the pancake flip. Uh, the idea is that there's a flat plate on the ground uh, rigged up on one side, and it's got cribbing under it on the other side. Well, it's got cribbing under it all the way, but it's supposed to hinge on that cribbing on the other side. Uh, the idea is that you hoist and bridge and trolley as necessary to keep that line as vertical as possible as you're lifting it to flip it over. And uh, we do have uh, hinged and unhinged versions where the hinged versions are actually attached to the ground and if you pull too hard up on that it'll pop it off the hinges and you'll fail the scenario so this is one of you know let's say 25 or 30 scenarios besides anything that might be included with the sort of cco testing layout but uh, we thought uh, this was important just to bring up at just a typical scenario that this has three or four iterations one I think if I recall one is where the this this is sort of like a steel barge section that's got to be flipped over to be welded on the back side. So 
So the idea here is, I think in one orientation, that the unit has to be flipped in line with the bridge. Another orientation, the unit has to be flipped in line with the trolley. And then another orientation where it sits 45 degrees to both. Now you now we've got a bridge and trolley simultaneous to hoisting and or lowering. So it really calls on skills for the operator to have to uh, maintain the plumb line, you know, plumb for his hoist lines. But he's got to continually then work on his bridge and trolley, which may, you know, are really kind of two different speeds. And he's really got to work on touch or sheet. So um, this little, this well, you can get a lot of mileage out of this to just gain touch and load control uh, in one for manipulating one or two little loads like this uh, can take. It could an operator might spend uh, thirty, you know, a candidate might spend thirty minutes or an hour on just on this two or three step scenario to get uh, a little better feel for the crank. Absolutely. And yeah, we. Uh, uh, we've, Go ahead. We, we really, we really, I, I could see where this is really going to benefit, especially in the shipping, where we are actually, I don't want to say flipping, I'll say rolling. Yeah, up. turning, load Bundles up, riding, and load down. We are rolling up. We we stand. We put a bundle webs on them, and it's hard to teach a guy who's never done it with magnets. I'm not talking about right. with rigging or chain. You got to have such good crane control with the magnets, and mag control. So yep. I mean. You've got to be able to bridge and and not bridge too far because we don't want to roll the thing over. But you've got to know when that tipping point occurs, and I got to know when to you know plug my crane back from my bridge, even if I'm not using my trolley. Now in the old bay, you would use your trolley to do the same thing. So it's a it's a it, it it's going to help you in all those areas. I think it's going to be awesome. I mean, I could, I could try to teach you in a crane, but I'd much rather teach you how to do it right there. Sure. Yeah. This simulator is perfect. Uh campsite for that uh, education right and uh, and if you get too far out of plumb uh, the the simulator or the developers have created this uh, rope failure uh, issue you might explain that yeah it's a, it's a hard failure essentially the rope will get you know it'll it'll detach from the crane at the top where the where the where the hoist drum is because it cuts on that on that uh, that uh, casing you know because it falls if it falls too far out of plumb so there are penalties and there are surprises in this. Uh, they they also in other as in other scenarios they could have a sling failure event occur. They could have uh, out of plumb rope get cut up on the crane. Uh, they can have other you know issues that can occur in real life. So those are embedded uh, throughout this whole VR uh, uh, experience. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we'll move on to our next scenario, the new scenario type uh, pickup sticks. And I think you guys are touching on this a little bit where we have, you know, multiple steel beams or steel beam bundles where they need to be picked up by that magnet bar and moved on to trucks. And the idea is that you learn how to do that safely and then also efficiently where you can get groups of bundles together and pick them up all at once and then move them to the truck. And that that uh, triggers a bonus objective where you optimize the loading. So so you're telling me I can I can pick up single sticks and make a bundle? Uh, I don't. I think we have a minimum bundle size right now. Uh, we just had the developers put the single beams up, mm -hmm. but I think we have minimum bundles of threes or fives, maybe, mm -hmm. at this point. Right. And so they come up as a unit. However, you know, if the operator doesn't get to the north-south orientation properly, we can have the thing out of out of level, or uh, sideways, east and west, out of plumb. So all right. kinds of things can occur. It's going to be a natural weight, and the crane will. Mm -hmm. The, the load will react to the engagement or disengagement of the mag, right? And the right. mag uh, connection is on the belly box. Also, there's mag engage, disengage up on the hand controls for the desktop or motion base. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think with the respect of, we, we talked about what we have, 40-foot bars. And 60s. That, and 60s, yeah, 40s and yep. 60s. What was our spreader bar length, Mike, 30 foot? I think so. Uh, tw uh, twenty to twenty-five at least, and uh, okay. so I'd have to double check that. But yeah. But I, I mean, I'm looking at you got rotation in, and this crane is going to react. If right. I'm if I'm if I'm too far west, and I, I can pick the load up, and it picks up, and and I should be able to recognize it how it picks up that it picks up yep. a little bit off center. When I go to rotate, 
is that is the rotation going to react with that weight on the you know all the weight on the east end? Yeah, you'll have a down. You'll have a if you have a down end. I mean, if you're out of plumb, out of level, it's going to helicopter badly. And yeah. uh, you know, a guy, so an operator can clip and snip and nail other obstructions around if we're not flying level. Uh, you know, uh, bad things can happen. So we really are trying to get them to recognize, get that hook center over the CG of the load, center gravity of the load, and make sure that you've got it as plumb and level as possible. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the spreader bar is, is essentially your hook. You bet. Yeah, hook is there, and then directly below is CG of the bar, and directly below that should be the CG of the load. Right. Yeah, that that's a great training tool because you don't know how frustrating that is to get somebody and try to train them in the real world with real product. <laughs> right. Well, we can and do you can that wreck a lot. Rotation. Yeah. Yeah, you can wreck a lot of product and tie up a lot of time. Uh, yeah, you know you, that that's where the that's where the VR unit really you know wins the day is that it reduces all that risk and extra cost. I agree. Okay. All right. And our last type here. This is sort of a kind of it looks a little bit more fun, but it's still very important is the, the bowling scenario type where the idea is to learn how to accelerate and decelerate the crane uh, to learn the coasting speeds to get them positioned right over the top of a defined set of bowling pins that will get knocked over if they're, you know, just over the top there. So it's uh, it's really figuring on either uh, trolling and coasting deceleration to a, a pre pre planned arrival point or bridging so that you can uh, get a fit sense and feel for what the weight of the machine is, the drive system, the speed at top end, and then the deceleration uh, pace to try to um, let the crane bring itself to what you've decided is to be your target point. Overshoot it, we knock stuff down. Undershoot it, you're, you're penalized as well. So you know you're really trying to get re refining your control and, re and your um, hand-eye coordination with your sense of machine activity and response. Um, and this this one is um, also in, let's see, we will have reverse plugging. You talked about that on the other crane and you'd be able to do that one time, is that? Yeah, the idea is that if you're, if you're bringing it to that braking position, you can reverse plug, you can activate the reverse direction once. And then if you try to bridge or trolley forward again, it'll start penalizing you as as because the idea is that you do it once that you know exactly how far it's going to coast how far or how far uh the the reverse plugging is going to let it go yep. before it stops nice so, so once so well, once you reverse plug it you can't go back to the other direction yeah i mean you can let off the reverse plug but you can't you can't go you can't uh, bridge your trolley forward again uh, you can but it causes a penalty yeah i understand I mean, it, so the, I, I just got I got one question on that. Hmm. On that, on our chair, uh, the motion-based chair, when hmm. when we're bridging, when you're bridging this, going to these bowling pins, and I get to plug it one time, is the chair gonna move and actuate? Oh yeah, you'll so you'll probably like, feel that. Because you know, when I'm in a crane, I, I, and there's a lot of feel, a lot of seat feel, to plug in a crane to where you know how the crane's moving, what it's doing. So I, I'm anxious to get in that chair and see if that chair can simulate that plugging of the crane. But I, I, I mean, I don't know why it wouldn't. And I remember that's one thing, Andrew, when he rode the cranes from Sirius Labs when he was down here, yeah. he felt that yeah. and, you know, anxious to see that. Yeah, we'll make sure that's translated appropriately into the, into the, the motion base. Uh, the desktop, obviously, you can't really feel it, but but yeah, on the motion base, we'll we'll definitely make sure that that is fine tuned. So so here's a question: Do you, we could actually get it all tuned up, you guys? And this is a little bit of a joke, but we could tune it up so that we could sense that the uh, overhead crane cab is bolted on with ten bolts, or only hold on by two bolts, and then you get a lot more sensation whenever you try to <laughs> start and stop. What do you think? Yeah, let's yeah let's do that. <laughs> you know, a beginner a beginner may need a little bit more feel. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, we. Uh, I think if Andrew recognized that as critical, we would get, try to get that translated into the motion-based seat. Let me tell you, I, I just, I just think it bears for me to explain in our world why that's so important. Yeah, I go can ahead. Take, I can take a guy 
who has ran a belly box controller for 10 years and, and, and is a good operator. And I can put him in the cab of a crane and he simply turns into a mediocre operator because the seat's moving, the crane's moving. I'm not, you know, I can't, I can't run this crane. All this stuff's moving around. I'm sitting in this seat and it's moving. And you do the reverse on that. Take that guy out of the seat of the crane and put him with that belly box and he can't feel the crane. So yep. he doesn't, it doesn't feel the crane stop. He doesn't feel the crane move or shake or drift. And there's a lot of feel in that seat of crane drift or, or moving or stopping. So, I mean, I just experienced it. And the only reason I say that is because I've been there. I've done that. I've experienced that sensation of both things. And it, and it means a lot for that, for that seat to, to move is what sure. I, I guess is what Sure, you bet. Well, we will definitely be uh, talking and working with SLI to see if whatever is whatever is possible to get that integrated into that and to get full use of the motion-based seat um, yeah. so that it responds, reacts, and it kind of and it mimics um, the events happening with the crane overall. So, you bet. I think it'd be awesome. All right, so come to the uh, end of our end of our webinar here. Uh, Got uh, there we go. Uh, question and answer period. If we've got any uh, questions uh, from you guys or from the audience, uh, anything that we might not have covered, uh, go ahead and let us know. Keith, do you have any questions before I give some audience questions? Uh, no, actually, I can wait until. I mean, the question I have is, when 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 are we going to be able to try this out, and would it help? Uh, if we made a trip too serious, you know, because we're real anxious to get this in our hands and try it out so we can make give some feedback on what Bo was talking about in the seat, how the crane reacts to the controls, you know, that's that's the question I got. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a, a dev build coming out uh, this Thursday or Friday. I'm going to look it over and we're going to determine whether or not we can send it uh, to you guys. The last one, it, it was a little bit too messy to, to send out we didn't we didn't feel it would meet with approval so we're gonna we're gonna gauge this one and i'm, I'm hoping this will the, the crane will be in the environment for this build and we can actually show you guys firsthand what this what this looks like so okay and to be honest our uh training room that our simulator is in along with all of our training hydraulics and electrical actually the power's cut off that building so we have a week or so i mean i'm not wanting it tomorrow because we have no power to our training room because we're extending it to include a classroom. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm not meaning tomorrow. I just kind of wondered. Sure. Well, we'll once we know on Thursday after this uh, team meeting with SLI, then we'll chat with them also and see. Now, you guys have a desktop, not a motion base, right? We got uh, both. We got both. Okay, so uh, actually they could send, you know, once it kind of gets all cooked up, they they will be sending it to your computer uh, that drives your VR system, and uh, then you'll be able to experience the beta testing right there on your location. Okay, right. And, you know, I could do desktop in my office. It's just that the motion-based chair doesn't have any power right now, but it won't be long. Sure, no problem. Okay, we'll we'll get you... Keep you posted after the Thursday meeting. Ken will be sending out a, an update then. Absolutely. Go ahead with your questions uh, here if we've got some, Amanda. Yeah, I've got a question from the audience. Um, what feedback have you received about how the simulator is compared to a live overhead crane? Uh, so we, Mike and I, we did a little, we did a little testing of the crane. Uh, we found that it was at first uh, just a little bit. Uh, the the coasting it decelerated and accelerated a little bit too too quickly. Would you say? I'd say it, it felt sluggish. Sluggish, as you might say, is that when you when we were bridge, I was bridging and or trawling, and uh, I would uh, let off and it would do a normal deceleration. Um, I wasn't getting much pendulum effect with the block. It was it was uh, retarding or slowing down the pendulum action too quickly mm -hmm. and settling too quickly. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, it really needs with a nice fall that it has, you know, a 40 foot fall on the block that uh, it actually should sit there and wiggle and waggle back, you know, for a minute or two. Exactly. If I have some, if I've been bridging all the way down the runway, then I let off. Mm -hmm. There ought to be a reaction that takes a minute or two, unless I counteract it, it should actually have this 
going on. So it was dampening a little too quickly, which is simply an electronic fix right. that they make. Uh, I, I was on the beta testing team for the Tadano 100-ton uh, hydraulic boom crane, and uh, moving through the uh, test corridor, and uh, with the swing, boom, down, and hoist, uh, I would bring bring uh, test weight and chain in and, and come off the controls, and it was dampening too quickly. Mm-hmm. I'm, we made a phone call and an update within 30 minutes. This team, it was like the brakes came off. Yeah. Is and I was like, oh my gosh, I was just, I was. Then it was, you know, more like a real crane. I mean, it's just tweaking that these guys can do is incredible to get the crane to respond, you know, in a more uh, realistic manner. They're not crane people. That's the whole thing. SLI, they're not crane people. You've got to teach them and show them everything you need to do. And that's why it's imperative we get uh, good good operators like Bo and Heath to uh, help us as well to do the testing to give us feedback on, you know, what is it, uh, what's lacking or what needs to be upgraded and updated. So the realism, it's all gettable. We just have to tell the the geeks what we need, right? I mean, that's what that's what this gets down to. So the the machine's a- absolutely able to do it. Mm-hmm. We just have to um, give them the right information to get the re- you know the response out of the crane. Yep. Yeah. And like I said, Mike and I we gave that feedback to SLI. Uh, it's, it's been put into the new dev version of the overhead crane, and we're we're hopefully going to be testing it out. Uh, this Friday or Monday, and making sure that it that it looks and feels good enough to send off to you guys for for further feedback. So, okay. All right, I've got one more audience question. Um, how will the simulator help prepare people for a CCO exam? Oh, so we have a uh, in our in our other over, or in our other mobile cranes, we have uh, NCCCO uh, courses with NCCO's blessing, of course. Uh, we actually set out the Z corridor and the barrels and the uh, and the you know the, the stop circles, the start circles. We we made these courses to be very similar, if not exactly like uh, the NTCCO practical exam, such that people could get on and practice and get a feel for you know the, the a rough terrain crane or a boom truck or a carry deck, and uh, and go through and get that confidence that they need for the NTCCO course. Now. In overhead, it's actually a little bit different. They don't have the barrels, but they do have a trolley lay down. And uh, I was talking with Andrew, and he's just constructed this 13 to 15 foot long chain that has those master links that you lay down on the targets. And uh, it's it's our most complex object in the sim yet, he tells me. And it's uh, uh, it's going to be probably the most vital task that we have in that sim to get constructed, because everything else we have is a corridor. We have the we have something that we can use for the horizontal obstacles uh, in the in the Z corridor, uh, but yeah, we do we do with NCCCO's blessing, we have those laid out in the VR uh, environment. So, so we're we're looking for uh, the CCO folks as well to help give us beta testing feedback, and that will be happening over time uh, to uh, to get the sensation of what what Andrew relayed to Ken. He said that there are 70 moving parts or something in this piece of chain, mm-hmm. and he said it's uh, very intense to get it to act naturally and to collapse, fold, roll, turn, uh, lay down, pick up. It's um, uh, but we're, but we're trying to get it to to mimic exactly what chain would do, and that's so so that you you either pass the test or you don't, you know, on that exercise right. with with some practice. Uh, and you want you want the devices that you're playing with to be just like the real thing. You don't know you're not sitting in a real crane. That's what we want at the end of the day, right? Hey, Mike, can I, Mike? Yes, sir. On the on the uh, that get back to that CCO deal. Uh, what is the uh, same scorecard they use? Like uh, when I go to put my hook over the test weight, uh, I can only once I'm ready, I can only hoist down. I can't trolley or bridge. Or I mean, is it gonna know if I touch? It's gonna. Them? It's gonna have all the same like penalties. Like you can go and see the the CCO video, and they'll say the points right. will be deducted for the following. We're gonna have right. all the same penalties uh, as per NCCCO's request. We're not gonna use the same point values because they definitely right. don't want their their scoring information to to get out. But 
you'll still be you'll still be like graded on the task. It just won't be exactly the same, but it still uses all the same penalties that would accrue in the in the in the actual CCO exam. Right. When you go on to the nccco.org website, anybody that's listening to this recording, uh, and you you click on the overhead crane certification, and you actually click on then viewing uh, samples of the practical exam. Basically, all that's been replicated and is being replicated right into this unit. Exactly. So um, the uh, you know the, the so when you pop open uh, one of those tasks, you're going to see exactly uh you know what the what the challenge is and, and the performance of that and we we provide deductions and or information on the side to let you know how you're doing for time and uh, any infractions or anything that you have against you i hope that helps yeah i i was just thinking back to when we did the belly box and I made the course and everything, and how some of the. But I took. I, I agree with. I, I agree what you're saying. It's going to be the same thing, except a different point value. But like pars are relevant in this thing. It's just whether the the same penalties incurred. It don't matter if it's 100 points, 200 points. It doesn't matter. Sure. Yep. I got right. You. Well, hey, it's been fantastic to spend time with you guys, and thank you, uh, Ken and Mandy, for inviting me and uh, Heath and Bo to participate in this. We uh, appreciate. Um, uh, appreciate uh, being able to get on the phone and chat and uh, share with you some of the reactions and responses to what you guys have been doing. You know, it's uh, we're not part of the development team that has to get into the X's and O's, ones and zeros. We're just, you know, we're we're field and industry folks that try to bring some of that realism to you. So it's a team effort, mm -hmm. and uh, we we appreciate you inviting us uh, to participate. So. I'll be quiet and let you guys close this out. We appreciate everybody on the line, too. Uh, uh, thanks for being with us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Heath and Bo, for joining us this morning. Yeah, this is great. Y'all oh, yeah, yeah. have done more work than we have on this, so we appreciate y'all. <laughs> yeah. Yep, I will pass this back to Andrew, and we will get cranking on it. Okay, Thank very you so good. so much, guys. All right, we're signing off. Thanks, everybody, for attending, and we look forward to seeing or having you with us on, on another, another monthly discussion. Thanks. Right.